Welcome to the first St. Catherine College Honors Colloquium, a showcase of student research and creative work. Thrilled to be here with you this morning. This is a major accomplishment for us. The Honors Program launched in fall 2011, so we are not quite three years old. We started with only five students, but as of fall 2014, we will have more than quintuples to nearly 30. We've had the pleasure of seeing them transform from shy, disconnected strangers to a community of affirming, collaborative, and challenging scholars and friends. Our highest academic achievers make us proud not only in the classroom, but as participants in nearly all of our athletic teams and a variety of extracurricular activities and organizations. What you see here this morning from our students will undoubtedly impress you, but I want to highlight the tenets and goals of honors education so that you will fully appreciate their work as proof not only of their individual accomplishments, but of the success of the program. The mission of the Honors Program at St. Catherine College is to develop a dynamic community of academically exceptional students and inspiring faculty, and to provide an enhanced opportunity to pursue interdisciplinary critical thinking, innovative inquiry and pedagogies, academic and creative curiosity, and holistic personal enrichment. Honors courses are different by design. The instructor of an honors course should not be the source of knowledge, but the facilitator of knowledge discovery. The students should not be regarded as recipients of facts or truths deposited by a lecturer, but as explorers and creators of knowledge. Honors courses implement inquiry-based learning, a pedagogical method in which students not only ask their own questions, but learn how to find their own answers and then how to ask better questions and find better answers. All while challenging each other as a community to the rigorous pursuit of truth, which is our college mission and the Dominican way. The goals of an honors program overlap with the aims of Dominican higher education. The four pillars of Dominican life are study, prayer or reflection, service and community. These values date to the 13th century in Southern France when the Spaniard Dominique Guzman founded a religious order composed of men and women with the sole idea of preaching the gospel. Dominicans almost immediately became involved in the academic world. Since preaching presupposed knowledge, Dominic sent his early members to universities to learn and then to teach. Dominic set study not as an end in itself, but to be a means to service to others. Study then was to be combined with reflection or prayer on the world and on the needs of the time in order to envision and work towards a better, more just world. Listen carefully to our presentations today and you'll hear every one of our students address these pillars. Dominican sister Arlene Flaherty asks, where if not in the classroom of a Dominican college can we grow commitment to the integrity of dialogue, the valuing of difference, the engaging of a common quest for truth? An honors program in particular is the perfect place for this. This morning you will hear a variety of perspectives, both students and professors, from our honors program. You will see demonstrations of the fruits of our labors. Yes, we study. We study hard in an honors program, but despite the stereotypes of honors students, that is not all we do. Our honors program students apply what they have learned to reach new understandings of their civic, spiritual, and social lives as compassionate, engaged members of their community. Now we will hear from a faculty member who is a paradigm of all I have been describing, the director of the Berry Farmer Program, Dr. Leah Bayans. As she comes to the stage, please refer to your program for a description of the incredible course she taught as part of our honors program. It will make you want to be an honors student if you're not already. Please welcome Dr. Bayans. Good morning, and thank you all for your patience this morning as I came in on two wheels. <laughs> um, it is my distinct pleasure this morning to tell you all about an interdisciplinary honors course uh, that I organized last fall and carried out with three outstanding students, uh, English major Jenna Neese, from whom you will hear a little later, uh, English creative writing major and graduating senior Will Phillips, and psychology major Kelsey Brooks, who, if you have not met her, is a spitfire. Uh, she's um, she, uh, she's a, an unsung wonder. <laughs> um, so this course was titled Digging Ecocriticism, 
a practicum with readings in environmental perception and reflection. I have a predilection, as you can see, for long titles. Um, in it, the students learned about history, uh, the history, theory, and practice of environmental criticism, uh, otherwise known as eco-criticism, which is one of my areas of research and, and of, uh, distinct interest. Um, in literary studies, eco-criticism <coughs> simply and succinctly um, is defined as uh, the study of the relation between literature and the environment conducted in a spirit of commitment to environmental practice, or uh, praxis rather, or, or activism. <coughs> Um, this is the definition put forward by the germinal philosopher in the field, Lawrence Buell. Um, and uh, the critic, uh, Greg Girard, put it uh, more broadly, and this is one of the evolutions of the idea of ecological criticism. The widest, quote, the widest definition of the subject of eco-criticism is the study of the relationship of the human and the non-human throughout cultural history. Um, so it makes it uh, uh, applicable to uh, cultural studies perspective in that way. So, as a class, we considered these and other definitions by exploring uh, foundational as well as contemporary writing, and also by employing this particular critical stance in our um, discussions about those texts and contexts. Uh, we took up cultural and literary texts to consider how these kinds of artifacts shape and reflect historical, social, literary, as well as environmental conditions. So to this end, we explored a variety of texts, um, literary texts, so more kind of uh, what you might uh, more traditionally think of when you think of texts. So uh, texts like Darwin's The Origin of Species, uh, the Japanese poet Basho's haiku travel narrative, um, Annie Dillard's esoteric pondering of nature's god problems, as she calls them, in Holy the Firm. If you haven't read this, I highly recommend it. Um, T.C. Boyle's eco-apocalyptic novel called Friend of the Earth, which is quite a jaunt. Um, Turkish novelist Latif Takin's illustration of environmental injustice in a novel, a strange novel, uh, called Bergie Kristen. Uh, the translation of that is Tales from the Garbage Hills, so <laughs> that gives you some sense where we went with that. Um, so to help navigate and understand these writings, we delved into literary and environmental theory by the likes of, and I don't expect you to be familiar with these particular uh, theorists, but um, these are the real um, uh, kind of germinal philosophers in this field. People like uh, Cheryl Glotfelty, Joseph Meeker, Neil Everenden, and the environmental historian William Cronin. Um, but we also took our thinking out on the road, so to speak, um, with experiential learning activities. Uh, for instance, after reading Thoreau's uh, essay, Walking, uh, as you can imagine, for me, <laughs> that's a pretty easy translation. Uh, we trekked over to the Loretto Mother House uh, grounds and we took a reflective walk around Baden Pond, um, stopping at intervals to read key passages from Thoreau's essay and then recording and discussing our reactions. Um, activities like this really illustrate the course's thematic thrust, which was uh, the nexus between literature and terra firma. Uh, the ground beneath our feet and all the lives therein. Um, and in some, it was really heartening and instructive to witness these bright and inquisitive and thoughtful students uh, thinking about the country, the city, and the suburbs, about the wild and the tame, and really about the intersections of nature and culture. Um, I was pleased to see how they wrangled with issues that were complicated because they were messy, they were outrageous, <coughs> they were terrifying, they were frustrating, but they were also sometimes beautiful and compelling and always thought-provoking. Um, ultimately, we had exactly the kinds of conversations about environmental stewardship and the complications thereof that I hoped we would have, and um, I believe that we all emerged really with a better sense of our own individual and collective responsibilities, and um, you know, I'm, I was really, uh, these are, we had some really difficult conversations because not only the texts were complicated because, but because um, the ideas of the environment and the ideas of ecology are often really thorny, um, as well as, um, there can be times when it feels very hopeless, <laughs> especially when you're reading about eco-apocalypse. <laughs> um, but we always try to turn our attention to um, 
what, what was hopeful in the text, what was hopeful about the ways in which um, we might engage in our own kinds of, um, not just reflective activities, but actually life, life commitment activities that would, um, you know, ameliorate some circumstances, but um, which would, you know, give us at least some means for uh, moving forward and and not being overwhelmed by some some of the sometimes um, dire well the very dire circumstance that we face with um, you know climate change circumstances that we face with climate change um, with local f and industrialized food systems um, so those are you know that's kind of an overview of what we covered in the class and I think that as the as the first honors class that I have taught at St. Catherine, it really gave me a sense of the range of these students' thinking and the range of the ways in which they can engage with some really, um, really key, pivotal, dire uh, issues. So I was um, honored to work with those students, and I'll be pleased to hear some of them talk today. So, thank you. Speaking of difficult texts, now we will hear from Jenna Neese, who has written a piece of literary criticism in response to another piece of very difficult literary criticism that I assigned in our 400 level class on Toni Morrison. Jenna is also the winner of Best Paper in American Literature at the Alpha Chi National Convention in St. Louis. Jenna Neese, please share it. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Dr. Tuttle said, I wrote this paper um, as part of her class about Toni Morrison's Paradise, which was absolutely nothing like I expected, and um, definitely broadened my horizons, I'll say that. Um, the book summary reads, Paradise opens with a horrifying scene of mass violence and chronicles its genesis in an all-black small town in rural Oklahoma. Founded by the descendants of freed slaves and survivors in exodus from a hostile world, the patriarchal community of Ruby is built on righteousness, rigidly enforced moral law, and fear. But 17 miles away, another group of exiles has gathered in a promised land of their own, and it is upon these women, in flight from death and despair, that nine male citizens of Ruby will lay their pain, their terror, and their murderous rage. From the beginning of his article in response to Johnny Morrison's book, Millard had me on my toes. Um, he led me to examine the novel Paradise in a way that I had not prior to the reading of his article. Of all the things that I would have said about Paradise had I been asked, I had never considered it to be a particularly fantastical book, um, despite the notable supernatural elements throughout the text. But after reading his work, I've come to understand that while it's not a stereotypical fantasy novel, it does include many specific types of fantasy, such as political, sexual, personal, and psychoanalytical, etc. Um, the thesis that he provides in the introduction of his work is as follows. I want to demonstrate the validity of Zizek's claims regarding the concept of fantasy in four steps, ones that move progressively from the objective to the subjective, first by examining details of objective culture life and as these exhibit political ideology, second and third by examining objects, events, and details of subjective implication of personal lives as they exhibit sexuality and its psychoanalytic implications, and fourth, by examining a combination of these in the process by which one central individual subject traverses the fundamental fantasy driving his life and reaches a point at which he divests himself of fantasy. Now that very daunting statement, once pared down to its most LASIK level, um, serves to inform readers that Millard's goal in writing the article is to simply validate and support Zizek's assertions about fantasy in four steps. However, for my part, I found the more distinct and concise theses that he provides at the beginning of each section of his work to be much more informative and beneficial in trying to gain an understanding of his objectives in writing. At the beginning of the section titled, There's No Room for You, Millard says, in a first step, I want to look at how political fantasy may be imbricated in objects, language, and events that have no pr intrinsic political value. The following section, Sex, Nuns, and a Single Girl, begins with the statement, in a second step, I will consider how paradoxical may be sexual fantasy, not only within a, sub a human subject, but also within a pretentious domicile, riddled by fear and desire. A man and a woman, the third section in the article, begins in a third step, closely related to the second, 
I will consider the implications of the impossible sexual relation as it materializes between two subjectives in the novel. Subsequently, in Walking Barefoot, Millard posits, in a next step, I want to suggest how a subject and a narrative might move through or beyond the fantasy. And the final section, Crossing and Crossing Off Fantasies, leads off with, in a final <coughs> step that incorporates Deacon's move, I want to suggest that there is a sense in which, for a writer, closure in a narrative is itself a version of traversing the fantasy, of crossing and crossing off the interlocking motifs that constitute a story or a novel. While the vast majority of what he had to say was incredibly interesting as well as puzzling <coughs> to me, um, I think I found most intriguing his position on one of the characters, Gigi, that he addresses in Sex Nuns and a Single Girl. He refers to her as the pivotal figure amongst the convent women, um, and Millard suggests that she is the exception, for she not only seems relatively undamaged sexually, but she is also the one woman found in the convent at the time of the assault who may remotely be said to represent that excessive sexuality feared by the men of Ruby and by the nuns. This notion fascinates me because while each of the women could be construed as a pivotal character in the text, um, and each of them has an important position within the dynamics and the hierarchy of the convent, I had always personally constructed that hierarchy as placing Consolata Sosa at the top. She's the kind of mother figure who welcomes many of the men. Um, and until reading his interpretation of Paradise, I had never given any substantial thought to the amount of discrepancies between Gigi and the rest of the women in the convent, or really the discrepancies between any of two characters for that matter. I was much more focused on the union that the convent itself had brought them to than the individualities and differences between these characters. And I had certainly never looked at the distinctions between each of the women from a perspective specifically concerned with their sexuality. Um, a close second of my interest in Mollard's take on the novel which the concept of, was the concept of a distinction between an object and an object cause, which he discussed in A Man and a Woman. And from my limited understanding, this stemmed from um, the theories of Zizek, which is about all I can tell you about it. Um, <laughs> while, Millard's write, while Millard's writing throughout this section gets pretty convoluted, uh, the idea of a necessary differentiation between an object and the why behind your desire for that object um, seems like a pretty obvious idea, and yet it never crossed my mind personally. Um, we as humans have a tendency to think of what we want, not in specific terms of why we want it, but rather to link the two and use generalized logic such as, I don't know why I want it or I just want it. <laughs> when asked to identify a reason as to why we want any given thing, most of us would be unable to provide an answer that would truly satisfy that question in its entirety. And Millard implies that the relationship between the two is not so much an observable, identifiable thing, but is a subconscious justification that for the most part, we never feel the need to investigate or qualify. He applies this to the relationship between two of the major characters, Consolata Sosa and Deacon Morgan. Um, fascinating and aggravating was the way in which he uh, uses Consolata as an example of this, reasoning that the object cause of her desire for him is not Deacon himself. He submits that Consolata finds herself attracted to Deacon, at least in part because of the similarities in his persona and that of the Brazilian men who had sexually abused her when she was a child. He writes, for Consolata, the object cause, an obstacle, is precisely Deke's repetition of those hyper-masculine figures from her childhood who represent both fathers and molesters. She desires him because he represents those figures and she cannot have him for the same reason. This idea that Deacon is no more than a sort of reincarnation of the type of man that she had been sexually involved with prior to that, regardless of the fact that it was a forced involvement, um, and had come to associate with the sect act and sexuality as a general rule, is relayed in Millard's statement, Indeed, hope may be the very thing fluttering in Consolata, but the flutter seems more likely a revival of ancient, nearly forgotten sexual urges. The thing she loves in him is the one that she unconsciously recognizes, though she does not recognize it as a thing of her unconscious, and it is that which she finds and that to which she responds. Millard's address of the convent massacre in Sex Nuns and a Single Girl was also especially stimulating to me insofar as he observes the event from the frame of mind that the massacre as a political act must somehow have a sexual base that is as a matter of sexual enjoyment as much as of political behavior. As reprehensible as the murder or possible murder of these women at any rate, um, it never occurred to me that there could be a sexual component to this crime. You just think of it as horrific violence and move on. Um, it's without question a brutal and horrific act on behalf of the men of Ruby, 
but that it could be a psychosexual sort of crime stemming from a conscious or unconscious desire of these men to wipe out the women for the sheer fact that they were sexually intrigued by them or, as is more clearly insinuated in the novel, intimidated by their sexuality, um, had not dawned on me personally, but that seems to be what Millard is suggesting. Lastly, his construction and walking barefoot of Deacon and Stewart as a microcosm for the entire population of Ruby was a curious concept to me. Um, it in no way is this hard to fathom. It's got substantiation all throughout the text, and uh, it's not difficult to envision. It makes perfect sense when you think about it that, as Millard writes, Morrison establishes the Morgan twins married to sisters who look even more alike than do the twins as the parts of Ruby who stand for the whole. The massacre at the convent could easily be seen as the tipping point, the moment when the seemingly unquestioned convergence of the twins' viewpoints, as well as those of the town, become fractured and divisible. It is only after this event that we see with clarity the dividing line between the townspeople <coughs> who look upon the actions of the men as heroic and those who see the depravity that they have been brought on by their peers, population of the town with absolutely no exceptions, including the Morgan twins. And to that point, both microcosm, Deacon and Steward, and macrocosm, Ruby itself, had been united, at least as far as was visible to the outer world. And it is this one particular occurrence that the perpetrators never stop to reconsider the repercussions of that drives a wedge between the two halves of the whole in both cases. Moreover, the schism created between Deacon and Stewart humanizes Deacon and leads to what Millard refers to as his traversing the fantasy. It is through this happening more than any other that Deacon comes to recognize the differences between he and his brother and ultimately gains the understanding that the shame he saw when he looked at his brother was the shame he felt for himself. Morrison writes, it was as though Deacon had looked in his brother's face and did not like himself anymore. The emotional implications of this are astounding to me, and for myself, Deacon's redemption of sorts was the only thing at the end of the novel that left me feeling as though there could be any amount of hope for the town of Ruby. In addition to the material on which Millard based much of his assessment, works of philosophers and psychologists such as Freud and Zizek, with which I was for the most part fairly unfamiliar, um, he also posited throughout his article several ideas of his own that I had never given any consideration. His aforementioned perception of Gigi, the novel's inclusion of fantastical elements, though in unconventional and highly academic ways, including what he ascribes to Morrison as her own traversal of fantasy to her establishment of closure in the novel, were things that I had certainly never before ruminated on. And um, reading Millard's article, I can say with certainty, expanded my understanding of Paradise as a text and led me to consider the text in a variety of <coughs> unprecedented ways though it did so without calling into question many of the determinations that I had made for myself prior to the reading of his work. Thank you. Thank you. The old-fashioned model of honors education we now call punitive. It used to be that you took honor students and gave them extra work or harder work, and. We no longer believe that's beneficial, but sometimes it's a fine line between assigning them more sophisticated work and harder work, and each student in that course um, had to pick a piece of literary criticism and respond to it as, as I was prepping the night before, knowing that Jenna had chosen that one. I was just sort of shaking my head at myself, thinking, why am I making them suffer so? <laughs> I'm never guilty of underestimating them, but I sometimes pick things that are too hard. But I was validated entirely because Jenna came in and blew us all away and did such a wonderful job with a very difficult text. Next, you get a little bit of relief. Jenna writes the kind of stuff I like to write, but I know that's not everybody's cup of tea, so we're going to have a wonderful break, um, and we're going to move to a creative work. We have a wonderful piece of poetry that's going to be published in The Notebook, a progressive journal for women with rural and small town roots by sophomore Lauren Johnston. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm actually a junior here at St. Gabriel. Oh. So, <laughs> that's all right. No harm, no foul. Um, I'm here today to read a piece that I actually submitted to The Notebook. Um, and first off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about The Notebook and what it is um, and its importance to this area. Um, and hopefully it can interest um, some of our honor students and 
possibly other students here at St. Catherine. Um, it is a STEM from the Grassroots Women Project, um, which is a network of progressive thinkers, writers, artists, scholars, educators, and collaborators who are interested in exploring, celebrating, and critiquing the authentic experiences of women and girls with rural and small town roots. The notebook publishes writings um, and images on topics related to GWP's mission. Um, and I'll have this if anybody's interested you can approach me whenever I'm done, or I can send you an email. <clears throat> My name is Lauren Johnston, and I was born and raised in the suburbs of Louisville, Kentucky. I'm currently a student here at St. Catherine College in small town St. Catherine, Kentucky. I am majoring in biology pre-med. I am the judiciary chair, the bowling team captain, and honor student. I am a second generation college attendee <coughs> and I enjoy being outdoors in archery in my spare time. My piece is called Beyond the Concrete Jungle. I never labeled myself a city girl. I sometimes wondered what it would be like to grow up outside of the city, in the country perhaps. A majestic place with bonfires, animals, creeks, fields, and a simpler way of life. With age, I settled on the idea that it isn't where you were raised, it's how you were raised. That little piece of country I'd been searching for was in my heart all along. My real father also lived in the city, but I'd be danged if you could tell it from looking at him. He was a big man, towering six foot something, and he always wore blue jean overalls. He wasn't around much, but he did give me a small piece of my roots every time I saw him. He was simple. As long as he had his tow truck and beer, he was happy. Dad was the junk man and he surrounded himself with things that made him smile, oftentimes stuff that he found while junkin'. That simple mindset seems to have stuck with me. I don't worry much, I don't want for nothing, and I do what I can. This is my country. My stepfather also helped me come to terms with where my heart stood. He taught me how to shoot a bow when I was about six or seven. This became a hobby, a new favorite activity, but in the city, there are limitations. You had to have enough space, a target, a place where nobody would get hurt. We didn't get to shoot but a couple times a week, but that didn't change the way I felt with that bow in my hand. It was just nature and me for a moment, my country. When I was a young girl, I had many friends that loved to explore with me. We would take off day in and day out and go to the flood wall ditches and catch crawdads, fish, and tadpoles. This was our creek and this is where most of our time was spent. Traveling along the rim of the subdivision through tall grass to the big old tree that stood at the corner of, here we go, and come on guys. We would shimmy our way to the bottom of the concrete line trench and begin our expedition, wading through weeds and small trees that had grown up through the cracks. Down another concrete slope we would climb where the two trenches met at a T. Our favorite direction to go, left, that's where the mud, sand, rocks, and water <coughs> held the most life. The water would collect enough for us to swim, even though there was a perfectly good pool in the backyard. I preferred the adventure, the raw sense of being one with nature. In the winter, we would go ice skating down there and walk for miles through the snow to the biggest sledding hill we had ever seen, dubbed Devil's Hill. This was our country. I was always allowed to be who I wanted to be. I wasn't very girly, I didn't like makeup, nail polish, or tight clothes. My mother allowed me to embrace what made me comfortable. She never treated me like a doll, trying to dress me up or beautify me. Most of my childhood photos were of me running around naked with the biggest grin on my face. <laughs> I was allowed to be me and think for myself. I didn't have to fit a stereotype, and I learned to enjoy my life exactly where it was. I had created that majestic place right where I was, with bonfires, animals, and even a creek. Home is where the heart is, and my heart is in my little slice of country. I always respect the bravery of people who share their creative work with us, because that's not anything I could ever do. 
literary criticism is, is more remote than that. Another creative woman who shares her talents with the entire community is Professor Betty Brookfield, Chair of the Fine Arts Department, award-winning artist, Dominican associate, and candidate for magistrate. She will share with us her experience teaching Honors 201, Comparison of Romanesque and Gothic Architecture. Thank you, Tara. What a complimentary introduction, and um, I was looking around the room to see who that was. <laughs> uh, many, many years ago, when I first came to St. Catherine, I was interviewed for this position as Professor of Art by um, Assistant Marina Gibbons. She was at that time um, wearing two hats, academic dean and vice president. We were without, we were without a president at that time, and um, when I, I had no idea what to expect when I came here. And I actually had already taken a position in law for considerable more money and wasn't even entertaining this to be my new home. She took me to St. Catherine Hall, first off, and showed me the beautiful architecture there, the murals, the uh, statuary. Then from there we went to Magdalen Chapel, which was clearly Romanesque architecture. So I was just amazed. I said, where could I go? I had just returned from Europe and seeing these magnificent cathedrals in uh, well, all, all through Europe, in England and also Belgium and France and Spain. So I had a pretty clear identity of what I was looking for in beautiful Gothic architecture. When I saw St. Catherine Hall, I, I was amazed that I could be in the <clears> same <throat> building and teach students art history and have hands-on activities to go to both of these places and how magnificent it is to have both Romanesque, which is the rounded, uh, more barrel vaulted architecture, and then the Gothic is the pointed arches we know, and the uh, outside structures that support it, the buttresses. We don't have flying buttresses like we do in uh, Paris, but we do have some that I could point out to the students. So this is what convinced me to come here. And then when Dr. Tuttle asked me to uh, consider teaching an honors program class, I thought this is perfect, where we can go and look at the, these examples right here locally. St. Rhodes Church, <coughs> then also to St. Joseph's Cathedral in, in Bardstown, and the monastery. So we have a holy land in this area where we can travel around and actually take students to see these places. I believe it's more real. The papers that I, I received from these young women who appeared in my class, came in prepared with laptops. <laughs> I, I mean, it was, all, it was really much like colleagues. And I really appreciate, admire, and uh, want to continue this wonderful program that you've started for us. I don't know why. We didn't have it before, probably because you were not here. And it's, a, it's an enrichment. It gives the students a, ch a chance to be real professionals and search for, investigate, and write papers on the level that we expect from a real college level. I, I'm just in awe of the whole thing. And as we I haven't been here very long this morning, but the presentations that I've seen so far this morning are just wonderful, and I applaud you, Dr. Tuttle, for, for doing this. Thank you. Prepare to have your implicit biases confronted as you welcome the irrepressible Marsha Barrett. is about a problem that I see in modern society and I can't really even say modern society because it's been a problem for a while but it, it's been brought about more modernly. Um, there are a few rabbit trails that I chased during this paper but stick with me because it all comes together eventually. When you ask someone if humans or animals deserve more respect, 
Almost all will say humans. Well, first of all, humans are animals. If they are going to ask, they ought to ask, is the human species dominant over other species of animals? Now, I'm not saying people should ask this question. In fact, I'm saying the exact opposite. It is an arrogant and honestly pointless question. What exactly are people trying to prove with this question? If they think they are so superior to animals, then why do they constantly raise this question? It is the same as someone who will go out of their way to defend and put down others' religions and opinions. If a person was really confident in their ideals, they shouldn't have to, de to defend what they believe in to the nth degree if they truly think it is correct. So why do people believe that they are dominant over other animals? Well, most will tell you it is because humans are mo more intelligent. Okay, but by whose standards? What intelligence are we basing this superiority on? Human intelligence. So we have this notion that we are smarter than animals based on our own intelligence. Well, that's kind of stupid, isn't it? This is similar to saying that out of two cars of the exact same model, one of them has superior drivability because one of them is red while the other is yellow. It is funny that this, com this same comparison could be used as a metaphor for racism or any type of bigotry, because, in a way, it is similar. Yes, a majority of people understand the place of other animals and, and can appreciate them for that. But anything more than that in the treatment of animals is apparently irrelevant. People put domestic abuse over animal abuse almost every time. And I know what th thought crossed all of your minds. It is just an animal. I have grappled with this thought a lot, and it still crosses my mind every time I say it. This thought comes about for the same reason that, that the members of a pride of lions cares more, more about and will put the treatment of their pride before anything else. So some would ask, Marshall, what is your point in all this? You brought up a point of objection and immediately said that it was fine. My point is that this would be perfectly fine if humans were like a pride of lion. But we are not. We cannot seem to care for our own pride. We made up different races based on cultural differences, which is fine, but having done this, we have further distanced ourselves from the fact that we are all animals. In fact, we have gone one step further and are forgetting that we are all humans. You are American, Mexican, Asian, Canadian first, but human second. So if we cannot care for the members of our own species, what right does anyone have to say that abuse outside our species is acceptable at all? This brings me to my next point, war. War is a human invention, and we seem to be proud of it for some god-awful reason. Animals do not have war. They have territorial squabbles and fights over mates and food. But if you want to make the defense that they do, all I have to say is, at least they have a reason. If you take a step back and look at any war we have ever had, you will see how pointless they all are. We are constantly destroying ourselves over material gain and hate for one another. Other animals fight to live. That is it. They avoid confrontation at all costs, yet we seem to love and lust after confrontation and violence. The recent Iraq war is a good example of this. Whenever I hear this in a discussion, I will inevitably get, the qu get to the question, why did we have this war? And I will get the response, because we had to. And that doesn't really answer my question. When I get any kind of reason, it usually involves 9-11, the obtaining of oil, and because the Iraqis were in possession of WMDs, of which I will discuss all three really quickly. Yes, 9-11 was a terrible tragedy in our country, but going to war only creates more bloodshed. The pilots were also not Iraqi, so I don't know why we went to war. There. Going to war to obtain oil seems really stupid to me, because with all the fuel they need in the military, it seems like they are wasting their time. 
And what better way to prevent Iraq from using WMDs than to go and attack them? <clears throat> Sorry, I keep losing my place. I know there are a lot of polit political incorrectnesses in that argument, but that is not what I am here to talk about. I am pointing out the inhumanities and the fact that reason and rational thinking are re is replaced by this idea of, we have to. <clears throat> now there is aggressive behavior in animals of all kinds, but it is usually involving dis different species. When I hear these stories about a lion mauling a man, or a woman getting her face ripped off by a chimpanzee, all I can think is, you poor damn fools. If an animal is a carnivore or exhibits behavior that we would not approach in the wild, why would anyone think it would be a good idea to capture these animals and aggravate them? And when these attacks happen, people act surprised. I am not. I am not surprised when my normally lax house cat scratches me. Nor am I mad, because I clearly did something to piss him off. In spite of all of this aggressive behavior, you never see anything like a war. You do not see a herd of antelope wage war on a pride of lions after the herd gets attacked because there would be no point. It would cause more of them to die, and what would they do if they won? Eat the lions? Certainly not. So they would be killing without reason and animals are meant to kill in order to survive. Humans tend to deviate from this. Conflict is, also, is often started with miscommunication, and given how much conflict humans involve themselves in, I would say that we have a lot of miscommunication. Now, humans have said that animals do not have communication as advanced as we do, and mixed with the idea of communication causing conflict, this is frankly amusing to me. Communication is a transfer of information between individuals through any means they have, and humans have chosen primarily speech. Animals clearly have not, and that is why we think that we are above animals in this way. So let me really paint a picture for you all. Our idea that we have superiority in communication is that we can speak and understand one another. Furthermore, an animal's lack of communication is based on the fact that we cannot understand them. Therefore, we say that they have no way of communicating. However, if someone comes up to me speaking French, I will have no idea what he is saying due to the fact that I do not know French. So if I apply the same logic to a French-speaking person that I did to an animal, I must assume that this French person has no way of communicating. See, we don't think that way because someone speaking French is still human, but the point is still made. I am not pitching animal equality in this paper because there is not equality in the animal kingdom because of this idea of a food chain. But, animal, er, but humans have managed to screw that up as well. We are often told that we are at the top of the food chain but it is only because of the things we have created to cheat the system, such as firearms. If we were deprived of all that and given what we have naturally, we would be somewhere in the middle. Every animal exists for a reason, and I think we have misinterpreted that reason and abused it. We'll leave you all with a quote from Albert Schweitzer. When man learns to respect even the smallest being of creation, whether animal or vegetable, nobody has to teach him to love his fellow man. Compassion for animals is intimately con connected with the goodness of character, and it may be confidently asserted that he who is cool to animals cannot be a good man. Thank you. I'm Marshall in class because as you can see, he's not afraid to speak his mind, and he always asks questions I could never predict, keeping me on my toes. This next professor's brilliance is equally matched by her caring, generous heart. She's also the mother of award-winning honor student, Jenna Neath. Please welcome Professor Nora Hatton, Chair of Business Management and CIA. Good morning. I'm going to avoid the microphone if that's possible. Are you okay? Okay. Um, it is a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to um, grow an honors class, to develop this course, and then to execute it. And we are about three weeks from its completion, so I'll let you know after that how it turns out, really. 
but um, for many years I have been a student of uh, a particular author, uh, Margaret Wheatley. Um, about 15 or 20 years ago she wrote a book called Leadership in the New Science and it takes the emerging understandings of the new science, quantum physics, which was new not that long ago, students, believe me, it, it really was, um, and chaos theory and such, and she brings that into analogy with the business world. And I found that fascinating, and over the years I've been blessed a couple times to hear Dr. Wheatley speak, I've had lunch with her, and gotten to really drill her with my own questions. So as an academician and as a lifelong learning student geek myself, uh, her work fascinates me and I've really enjoyed um, interacting with one of my heroes. But it's not something you would normally teach in a management class, so I've kept it aside for my own enjoyment. And when um, Dr. Tuttle was recruiting folks to consider teaching an honors class, I thought, would we have students who would find that juxtaposition um, as interesting as I have done? And I thought, well, let's just pitch it and see. You know, so um, I pulled out some other author's work, um, Dr. Barry Oshry, who um, writes his, the book we're finishing right now in our class is um, written in poetry, um, not iambic pentameter per se, but it's certainly in prose. It has as many graphics, like little stick figures. He is an artist and a theorist and, and pulls that together with that management integrative uh, understanding and it's uh, again fascinating to me. The final author we will read is the work of John Cotter who is known for um, developing a, um, a pattern for change, implementing change and it um, has been applied in lots and lots of business situations. One of my favorite examples that I've used over the years is in higher education circles. So we have Cotter who is known for his understanding of change, Dr. Wheatley whose connection to quantum physics and chaos theory is very evident in her work, and Dr. Oshry's special connection to living systems theory. So I tried to map out, okay, we can't tackle all of science, and I am not a scientist by trade, so how can I do this in such a way as to really inform their conversation and build on what they already know from within the field of science? So what I've done is focus on the ability to uh, analogize, to draw comparison. And so their work, their actual final assignment, each student is assigned a specific theory. Jenna's assignment is living systems theory, and they chose these themselves. Um, Kelsey Brooks, Dr. Tuttle mentioned earlier, one of our softball players, has a game today, is why she's not with us. Kelsey chose um, chaos theory, which is one of my personal favorites, and Will Phillips, who is my son-in-law, conversely, it's an interesting dynamic in that room. Um, his topic is uh, quantum physics. And because we did not have a fourth student, but I wanted to make sure we brought it in there, um, I've done a little reporting back to them on uh, fractal geometry. And so we're looking at these kind of metaphysical, out there theories that come from very different worlds. But we spent the first two weeks learning about basic business. Uh, a crash course in Business 101. Here's the terminology. Here's what a sole proprietorship looks like. Here's what the role of a, a governing board is and so forth. So that we could marry that and they would have enough understanding of the business world, pull that with this um, scientific understanding and that their focus is on creating the analogy. And I think that's what Dr. Wheatley in particular does exceptionally well. They've done one paper and they've done that and they've done it very well. They've written a couple pieces of prose and narrative where again what they're doing is they're comparing concepts from the management and leadership world to those in, in the real world. Looking at chaos theory, um, how do we make order out of that? And having lived through moments of chaos within a business, um, I find that fascinating and I find it very applicable as well. Um, their ability to think differently is a blessing within the context of this course because it allows them to, to really draw equally well from both of those worlds. Neither of the students in this class, as it happens, is a management student or a student of any of the natural sciences. So these are different worlds for them and their focus really has been on, as they're learning these two fields, to draw the comparisons to them. Um, it's, it's, again, been very interesting and a blessing to me. And a great honor for me 
um, I, that probably won't happen for many of our other honors students, but um, to have my daughter in class, you know, so we're driving home at night and we're still talking about what Dr. Wheatley is saying. We're, well, I don't know, when you look at this level of quantum physics and you break it down to the molecular level, is that really comparable to the organizational chart in this, you know? These are conversations that normally um, parents and children don't have on their way home from school. So that's been a very unique aspect of this for me. Um, I do hope to teach the course again and see some of these younger faces in there and um, extend this conversation. Great job today, and I appreciate being involved in it. Now freshman Mariah House will share with us an adaptation of the best paper written in my English 102 last semester, The Impact of Mission Trips. Um, just some background on this paper that I wrote for her. This was my first English college class that I took, and whenever she told us that we were writing an essay, she, was, she just simply said, just write an essay, write about what you want. That made me panic, I, because I've never had that before. I've had a prompt, I've always had a prompt. And um, so I went back to my room that night and I was thinking, what am I gonna write about? What am I gonna write about? And in that moment of panic, I was just like, she's, she's one of those professors. She's one of those evil professors that's just trying to trick me. She's trying to play mind games with me. I know what she's doing. But then I kind of calmed down and just realized, no, uh -uh, she is. She's literally just giving me freedom. She's giving me freedom to write what I want to write about. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I went back and forth because typically in these situations in high school I would just write about soccer. I'm a soccer player, I'm passionate about it, I like it, I'm good at writing about it. But then I was like, no, what am I really passionate about in my life outside of that? And then I realized it was mission trips. I've done mission trips for about five years now, the past five years, every summer. And I like to tell people that's Whenever I'm on a mission trip, that's where I'm in my best mental state. So I, that's what I decided to ride on. Each year, thousands of eager and able people pack up their bags, load up in their utility vans, and begin their adventure of outreach and discipleship by embarking on short-term mission trips. Little do most of the first time missioners know exactly what they're getting themselves into. No air conditioning, sleeping on the floors, if they're lucky enough even to get a building to sleep in. And my personal favorite, four inch cockroaches. Have you ever experienced life like this? Have you ever even thought about it? Probably not. If you haven't, then you definitely should because there is a great reward within all of that madness. We as Americans are very fortunate for what and how we live, and that's often taken for granted. Although some may argue that short-term mission trips are generally focused on the missioners themselves, rather than the people whom are being assisted, they are vital to the understanding, <coughs> excuse me, they are vital to the understanding of universal needs by working with the underprivileged. They contribute to civic engagement and they strengthen the personal relationship one has with God. People who partake in short-term mission trips are exposed to the poorest cultures of our society, thus gaining an understanding of universal needs. Throughout my five years of belonging, or throughout my years of belonging to a devout and pretty strict Christian community, I've learned a few things about the world, some good and some bad. We were told that when we were young to go out and serve others and proclaim the gospel with good deeds. 
says children were rewarded by do with doing such things like picking up toys and just being nice to the other kids. But then we have to grow up. What about when we do grow up and begin to really open our eyes to what those demands call for? Sure, we'll see the pitiful children on the infomercials and send them 20 bucks. But is that where the good deeds and services should end? I don't think it should be. Paul Jeffrey states, <coughs> according to Don Tatlock, coordinator of the CWS program in Honduras, if housing was the sole priority, church leaders could ask folks to just stay home and send the money that they're going to spend on those airplane tickets. What's more important are the relationships they build with the poor and what they learn about why these people are poor. By giving up their time and their money to come so far, they're conveying a sense of love that pays off and increased self-esteem and encouragement among all of the villagers. Tatlock is right on point in this statement because mission trips aren't all about the physical labor that you have to execute, but also about the social benefits you share with those that you are helping. Giving them examples of helping others will most likely motivate them to want to carry on your practices. The encouragement you give them for five days that you're there could last these people five years. This being said, it is also a lesson, also a lesson for the missioners themselves. We, also, we often take for granted what we have and how we've attained it. We sometimes look at the poor and assume that they're poor solely because that they're just lazy or their own self-air. That's often not the case at all. Whenever you go out on these mission trips, you typically come to realize that the underprivileged have faced very hard times, and they've grown up in these poor standards of living, and that's really tough to come out of. When missionaries come to realize this, it creates a sense of empathy because we can all relate to hard times in some ways. Then that empathy can be turned over into something much, 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 much more a sense of love for humankind. Um, I'm going to stop and kind of show some of the pictures that I've taken from the mission trips that I've actually been on. This is me being really handy and painting a house because I'm a really good house painter. I learned that in five years. Um, this guy his name was Sean. I think I met him. I'm one, I, I might be wrong. I want to say that I met him in Nashville, though. He was the nephew of one of the residents that we were working for. And he, Sean's actually deaf. And he had to go to school. Like, there was a school right across the road from um, where his house was, the house that I was just painting. That was his house. And he had to go there. And we would ask him if he enjoyed going to school there. And, like, he could communicate a little bit with us. We kind of got to where we could understand him. And he said that it was a fine school and everything, but they didn't have any programs for him. There's no way that he could be treated differently than the other kids. Obviously, he needed that. <coughs> Excuse me. About halfway through the week, whenever we pulled up one morning to finish painting his house and everything, we looked up and he was... Um, standing on his porch with a paper in his hand and we were like what is Sean doing because he like you have to know his personality he was a goofball he loved to just like play around and throw footballs and stuff he was so fun and nice but um what we we're like what what is he doing out there standing there with this paper so we go up to him and we're like Sean what's in your hand buddy he's like he was like just holding it up he couldn't even speak he, he was crying he was so excited and so we, we were so confused, we grabbed the paper and I read it out loud to the group. He got accepted into his state's school for the deaf and blind, and he made the football team there. And that joy was just so, just so amazing. Like, because I think about my opportunities that I get, I, I don't wake, I didn't wake up for high school every morning like, oh yes, I get to go to high school today and learn, but that's what he's doing now. He wakes up every morning with a smile on his face. So excited that he gets to go to a school where he can actually learn. 
I'm not that good at picking up garbage, but that seemed to be what I was most useful for. They didn't like when I painted, apparently. <laughs> this was in Toledo, Ohio. We worked downtown at a school with um, the underprivileged preschool children. They got to go here to school for free, and they got every day when they would go home, they got like these these packages and we didn't really know what they were at first and no one explained them to us so eventually someone asked one of the teachers they were like what what do you all put in the packages and she said that it was food for that night because the kids they typically don't have enough food to eat that night so they feed them all three meals a day this little girl taught me one of the most important lessons so far that I've getting for mission trips, and that's, if you're working with children, always pack an extra pair of clothes. <laughs> because like, pretty much anyone who, whenever I walk into a room, she just got really excited to see me and she just peed all over me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this little boy, he, he really changed my life. This was actually the first mission trip that I ever went on. And I didn't know what to expect. I didn't, I'm from the country. I'm from southeastern Kentucky. I mean, we were obviously not super wealthy, but this was inner city, inner city stuff. And I've never experienced that before. So whenever I got in there the first day, this child had never met me before. This child did not know me at all, but I walked in there with what I had on in those pictures, a bandana on, my my workout clothes, I guess you would say on. He ran up to me and he looked at me completely serious and said, are you my new mommy? And that really just, that really got to me. Because even growing up in a broken home, I've never been to the point where I would look at a complete stranger and say, will you be my new mommy? And he did that every single day. And I really had to, I had to step out the first time he asked me that because it really caught me off guard. So I kind of took a minute and I gathered my thoughts and I talked to God and I said, how do, how do I handle this? How, how do I do this? And I finally went back in and I was like, no, I can't be your new mommy because I have to leave in five days and go back to high school, but I can definitely be your friend and we can play all week. And that, that was it, that made his day. But still, even that being said, every single day when I would walk in there, he would look at me and say, will you please be my new mommy? And it just breaks my heart. He was so sweet. Getting back to the essay though. Changes caused by missionary work aren't all necessar necessarily spiritually based. Attending a short-term mission trip can benefit you socially as well. Studies show that those who attend short-term mission trips are more likely to be more engaged citizens. For example, drawing on a nationally representative sample of U.S. adolescents, our research demonstrates that participation in religious short-term mission trips significantly differentiates the civically engaged from the non-civically engaged. This finding supports prior studies that highlight how religious mission and focused experiences can promote civic and social activism among participants. It is important, especially in today's world, to encourage young adults to participate in society. Anything that gets adults involved is such a tremendous benefit. Furthermore, some Christians today will argue that short-term mission trips are just a quick fulfillment of God's word, when realistically they are just the first step in fulfilling our roles as Christians by strengthening our relationship with God. According to the Holy Bible, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 through 20.
This quote is an example of the role Christians are obligated to play in the world. Yes, it is great to attend church and Bible studies, but God commands us to go out and show his love to others. Don't get me wrong, going out and spreading Jesus' word is a splendid way to pass your time. But what do people really get out of that? Hopefully, most are taking it all in and deciding to turn their lives around for God. But honestly, if you're out there standing on the street preaching at people, most will feel very hostile towards you and just turn the other way. But what about when you make the effort to do something? Something like rebuild a house, or serve food to the hungry, or play soccer with the little orphan children. Those are the things that make a difference in someone's life. Those are the things that change people. Those are the things that make people want to turn their love towards God because you are showing that love to them. Just because missionaries aren't necessarily out there yelling about their faith, that doesn't mean they're not moving mountains. The fact that these people are going out of their comfort zones to help others not only brings one's being closer to God, but it most definitely brings missionaries themselves closer to God. Once you start making positive changes for other people, you're going to start making positive changes in your own lives. In conclusion, we live in a world that is dominated by humans. And as humans, we have the choice to live together and work together to make this world a much better place, or to just sit back and let it brought to helplessness. We, as humans, have the opportunity to make a difference. We all need a beginning, so why not a short-term mission trip? They're the perfect opportunity to reach out to underprivileged cultures, become an engaged part of society, and find that relationship with God, which all begins with a simple task of just signing up. That's all. Mariah mentions the word freedom because I, I do try to give my students freedom. Their instruction was to write about something they're passionate about. And um, the young women who are getting ready to come to the stage, we were talking about this two nights ago in our first honors class. We did try to extend the freedom to choose some of the course content to the students, but often that results in paralysis at first. Um, as Mariah was mentioning, what does that mean? I can write about anything I want, because even giving them the instruction, write about something you're passionate about, that's still very, very broad. And of course, I get some papers on Duck Dynasty or baseball, which that's fine, but then I also get someone like Mariah who is connected to her passion and, and does beautiful work. The next professor is a person just like that, connected to her passion. And she has worked incredibly hard in preparation for this colloquium and for her honors course, Honors 202, Voices, Dialogue, Praxis, and Global Justice, and has given the honor students an incredible experience this semester. She's even going to be taking five of them to Denver in June to present at the Rouge Forum Conference. Please applaud her efforts and welcome Dr. Nancy McCrary. Uh, you know, at, this is the first honors course that I've taught at St. Catharines, and as I reflect on my experiences teaching Honors 202, which is uh, formally called uh, Contemporary Thinkers, so it's a study of contemporary thinkers, um, I'm reminded that teaching and learning is an interaction uh, in which both teachers and students learn. At best, teaching uh, the lines between teacher and learner blur and we all grow. Um, it's an incredible gift when that happens and it's when I most love teaching. And that's what happened in this course. Um, the next presenters are five students and they continually remind me that I have so much to learn. I even dare to say they're probably smarter than I am, which um, 
they're, they're certainly not wiser or older, but they're smarter. Um, they have incredible potential. They have done an incredible job, and I'm so proud of them. Uh, these young women have studied a range of contemporary thinkers, um, struggled with diverse perspectives, and made meaning by personalizing new ideas. In education, we sometimes call this process generative learning. And when it works, we call the outcome enduring, or knowledge that can be applied across a range of contexts. It's the best kind of learning. Um, this panel includes some of the most mindful students that I've had the privilege to teach. They're exceptionally smart, enthusiastically engaged, intellectually honest, and most importantly, they represent a hopeful future for us all. They're finding their voices and daring to speak their own truths. Please welcome them by listening to their voices very carefully. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? That I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room? Just like moons and just like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I rise. Do you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't take it so hard just because I laugh. Because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thoughts? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. As students at SCC, in practice to lead, in learning to be the future, we must act mindfully, employ compromise, and interact dialogically. What does this mean? We draw on contemporary thinkers such as philosopher Hannah Arendt, poet Maya Angelou, scholar Bell Hooks, activist Arundhati Roy, and writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie to articulate how we might create a dialogic community. In such a community, people allow themselves to open their minds to the ideas and thoughts of others. We will each cover a specific contemporary thinker and means of how they show these ideas <laughs> and how we can offer those to create a better community at SCC. And now we will begin with Rebecca Sands, who will discuss the importance of voice through the ideas of Maya Angelou. That was more nerve-wracking than I thought it was going you may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like Carol Rice. Born April 4th, 1928 in St. Louis as Margaret Johnson, Dr. Maya Angelou was raised in both Missouri and Stamps, Arkansas. During her childhood in Stamps, Angelo experienced the tribulations of racial discrimination, but this never curbed her passion for the arts. In her lifetime, Maya Angelou traveled the globe and accomplished many things. In the 1950s, she toured Europe where she studied modern dance. A year after recording her first album in 1957, she returned to the States to reside in New York where she joined the Harlem Writers Guild and performed in an off-Broadway production before writing and performing in her own. In 1960, she uprooted again and headed to Cairo, Egypt to be an editor for an English weekly publication. Not yet done with her travels, she then moved to Ghana to teach at the University of Ghana School of Music and Drama, in addition to working as a feature editor. As of mastering French, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, 
and a West African language was not exciting and impressive enough, Angela's studies abroad allowed her to collide with Malcolm X. This collaboration allowed Angela to return to America to assist in building Malcolm's Organization of African American Unity. But shortly after her arrival, he was assassinated and the organization fell through. After this tragedy, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. asked Angela to serve as Northern Coordinator for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. MLK's assassination in 1968 left her devastated. But through this came even greater beauty for Maya Angelou. It was in this time period she began work and published her renowned novel, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Flying through the world of film and television as well, Angelou's literary publications reached to 30 best-selling pieces of work. However, my purpose for being here is not to tell you that Angelo has served on two presidential committees, received countless awards, three being Grammys, and even composed and read a poem for President Clinton's inauguration. It is instead to relate the trials and achievements Angelo has experienced with those of the modern day student. My Angelo can be described as a woman with a very strong voice, but at what price did this voice come? To say that Angela rose from racial discrimination is an understatement, because all those who are familiar with her biggest piece of work know this to be only part of the reason she became such an influential woman in her life. At age seven, Maya Angela was visiting her mother when she was sexually abused by her mother's boyfriend. Ashamed, she only confided in her brother. When she learned that an uncle had killed her abuser, she felt responsible as if her words had killed the man. It was because of this that Angela was mute for five years. Angela describes mutism as a drug, saying it's addictive, you don't have to do anything. The thought of mutism can remind us that we're all mute at some point or in some areas of our lives. Many times in society, we come across women that are mute in their relationships or citizens who are mute in their role in government. There are even those who believe women or children should be mute in many or all aspects of their lives. As a very opinionated person, I could not imagine not being able to verbally express my thoughts and emotions. Something intangible is lost when you can't hear someone say the words, I love you. Passion is taken from angry words, and sorrow is not always detected. To be mute for five years drastically increases the amount of everyday or milestone life experiences that became more difficult for Angelo and countless others who are mute in the world today. As a college student, I've come to realize how important having a voice really is. We're our own community, and without communication, a society cannot function. One of the best examples of the necessity that is the college student's voice is advising. At this level of education, we're choosing our paths for the rest of our lives. During advising sessions, sometimes students are given detailed scripts of what their academic college experience should look like. Freshmen, in particular, rejoice at the, at the help of their advisors. However, some advisors are more like decision makers for their students. If as students we're not able to make the decisions to achieve our future goals on our own, how are we to truly achieve what it is we are after? If as a biology major, I am instructed to take classes that do not interest me or fit the pre-professional study of veterinary science that I'm currently involved in, am I using my time and energy in a beneficial way? I'm an advocate for well-roundedness, and I'm under no impression that colleges should not require general education classes, but in our college years, we reach a point where our main and sometimes only focus is pointed directly ahead at our future goal. Having set one so high myself, being achieved high grades in my science-based classes in order to be accepted into Auburn's veterinary school by the end of my junior year, my sights have been set on my future since I received my high school diploma in 2012. When students encounter these overly helpful decision-making advisors, how is this any different than mutism? Advising is supposed to be about helpful pushes along our ways and ideally more negotiable than many of us have encountered. Too many times students have left their meetings feeling pushed down rather than forward and disappointed with their lack of choices. Maya Angelou felt as if her words had killed a man and the way she worked towards a redeeming image of herself was to be mute. While we can all agree that her words did not kill the man or that stripping herself from all verbal expression was not the best choice, I think it's something that most all can relate to. In particular, we particularly when we as students are feeling rep repressed by our advisors we are feeling muted in our choices these choices are supposed to be mine to make for my future does the society and community want to mute college students is that their main goal 
What is to gain from muting our future doctors, teachers, and government leaders? Let us be mute no longer so that we can break open the cage and succeed in our lives in all the ways that are important to us as individuals. Let students be heard in their choices so that they are not accustomed to mutism in the stretches of their lives. I ask not to mute myself for five years, but to be heard with my urgent voice, the voice of the college student. I know why the cage bird sings, and now I know it's my time to break out of the cage that has held me. Here to break out of her cage as well, I would like to introduce Casey Barla to speak to us about Hannah Arendt. Good morning. Hannah Arendt was born October 14, 1906 to a German Jewish family in Konigsberg, Germany. Once the Holocaust hit, Arendt fled to Paris in 1933. In Paris, she worked with refugee organizations. Um, <laughs> she was married to Kenrich Blucher in 1940. In 1941, she immigrated to the United States with her husband and mother and became part of an intellectual circle in New York. She found more refuge in America, and within a year, she began writing many articles for the Partisan Review. Arendt published over 20 pieces in her lifetime. Some include The Origins of Totalitarianism, The Human Condition, Eichmann in Jerusalem, A Report on the Banality of Evil, and the first two volumes of The Life of the Mind. In 1951, Hannah Arendt gained her American citizenship. She died in New York at age 69 on December 4, 1975. Arendt talks a lot about praxis. Praxis is defined as translating an idea into action. Action is a hopeful beginning, whether it be on a global scale or a smaller scale. Praxis, or informed action, can be viewed as a process of human togetherness. Arendt viewed it this way and conceptualized a participatory democracy which stood in direct contrast to the, the illicit forms of government today. Arendt also stressed that action is one of the fundamental categories of the human condition which constitutes the highest realization of the Vita Activia. Vita Activia is defined as a life lived in action and active involvement in the political arena. What does this mean? It means that through Arendt's thinking, our action puts us above the life of animals but below the life of gods. It separates us also with the two other fundamental activities, labor and work. Not only does Arendt talk about praxis, but she also speaks about mindlessness. Hannah Arendt is famous for her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. She tells us that evil comes out of mindlessness. A good example she gives us of this is Adolf Eichmann. He was one of Hitler's men from the Nazi war and Holocaust era. She followed his trial in Israel where he was faulted for obedience and not thinking. This accumulates to mindlessness. Eichmann was a joiner, not intelligent, not mental, and not psycho. He simply did as he was told without thought. A mindless act is doing something, doing and thinking something, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> a mindless act is doing without thinking, and it is something many people do multiple times a day. Not all mindless acts are bad. It could be something as simple as brushing your teeth. But the ones that Hannah Arendt focuses on are the bad ones. These acts could be something such as following orders without consciousness or consequence like Eichmann did. Controversy is something that Hannah Arendt dealt with a lot. The controversy over the Holocaust, for example. The main thing about controversy, whether it be between two people or a community, is to figure out how to resolve it. But how do we maintain it? It seems that action is something in which co many colleges, such as SEC, struggle, especially with regard to students' voice. For example, promising to act on a certain student's suggestion and request. Too often, college administrators and other staff make, con make concessions in response to students' concerns, such as promising a needed policy change, and fail to follow through. When such promises are made to students and not kept, students feel disregarded, unimportant, and frustrated. Yet college is about a free exchange of ideas, learning to think critically, and growing into adulthood. Ignoring what is important to students silences them in ways that do not build confidence, nor does it promote self-efficiency. Learning to resist what is wrong, to refine one's voice, and to speak truth to power is not advanced by hollow promises. In sum, college students need to be heard and their ideas respected. Too often, however, college administrators seem threatened when students speak up, point out inconsistencies, and resist or protest practices that negatively affect them. The question is really, how are they to learn, refine their voices, and th think critically when their ideas are ignored or suppressed? All of these critically thinking women have contributed great ideas and created change in people's thinking, not overnight, not without practice in safe environments, and not through unkept promises. 
Another figure who talks about issues regarding voice is Arundhati Roy, and here's Lauren Johnston to speak about it. Oftentimes, people in power make decisions on behalf of those who they believe don't know what they need. They jar up every voice but their own, shove them to the back of the shelf, and forget they even exist. Sadly, this is the reality of many countries and people. I don't plan on giving a history lesson here, but I want you all to recount the recent injection of democracy into Afghanistan and Iraq. Neither country welcomed the idea or the implementation. It has been 10 plus years since the war on terrorism began, and we are now seeing the effects of the seeds that were planted. The trees of this labor were expected to produce ripe, edible fruit, but instead, rotten fruit has since dropped from the tree rather than being plucked. This is a global example of power and the effects when the voices that are supposed to be represented are put in a jar. Roy states in her speech, come September, quote, I believe that the, vast, the accumulation of vast unfettered power by a state or a country, a corporation or an institution, or even an individual, a spouse, a friend, a sibling, regardless of ideology, results in excesses. End quote. <coughs> Today I speak of power in an institution specifically. An institution in which the community is well-educated, able-bodied, and able-minded, but continues to feel that their voice is locked inside of a jar. Without anyone to listen, who is expected to speak up? Decisions are made every day on behalf of this community, this community of students, faculty, and staff. Not every decision requires the input of community members, understandably, but how often are their ideals and opinions needed, and when relayed, how often are they actually considered? As of late, there have been many discussions amongst students in particular regarding this, as we view it now, issue. If there is no confidence shown in the ability to make intellectual decisions, then the voices of those students will vanish one by one until you have an empty room and a cupboard full of jars. Who will be the one to open up those jars and hear what they had to say? Extracting power evokes powerlessness. When those who are in power make decisions for the powerless, the powerless have no purpose, no contribution. Having the purpose of bettering the community in which they live, the purpose of creating a place of joy, the purpose of creating a place where those who have a voice should be able to use it. Being told what to do and act rather than being asked or guided is one of the main extractions of power present in this college community and perhaps many others. Along with the extraction of power come those who want to create dialogue in order to have a voice and regain the dignity of voice through active participation. Dialogue, by definition, is the exchange of ideas and opinions. Creating a dialogic community begins by having an open mind regardless of whether or not you agree. Being dialogic allows everyone to have a voice with the guarantee that it will not be silenced even in disagreement. Having a dialogic community allows voices to be heard, minds to be changed, and the free exploration of ideas. Unfortunately, the mere relay of information is not considered dialogue. If we are to become a true dialogic community, many minds must be opened up to listening and at least hypothetically promote new ideas and critical thinking. Creating a... There is a long road ahead, but our future depends on it. Creating a dialogic community in a place where people who are well-educated can participate and expand their knowledge is the key to our success. It is the key to learning and growth. And now I would like to introduce Amanda Conrad, who will speak on the implementation of dialogue through the ideals of Bell Hooks. I'm passionate about everything in my life. First and foremost, passionate about ideas. And that's a dangerous person to be in this society. Not just because I am a woman, but because it's such a fundamentally anti-intellectual, anti-critical thinking society. As Bell Hooks stated, she is a passionate woman about many things, one of which happens to be the use of words to create a dialogic community. 
instead of acting aggressively. Many people wonder if there are other ways to address important issues, and more often than not, we find ourselves acting rashly. Bell Hooks has studied long and hard to find a way to approach topics with, with an open mind and works on teaching others the many things she has learned. Bell Hooks has overcome much strife to get where she is today. As a well-known author, feminist, and scholar, she has written many books. Born in Kentucky in 1952, Bell Hooks lived through the Civil Rights Movement as an African-American woman and has used those experiences to her advantage. Focusing her writing on race, gender, class, and sexual oppression has forced her to re-innovate herself. It is stated that Bell Hooks used to be a speak first, ask